So I, I want you to um, suspend reality for uh, a brief period of time. I want you to think of when you felt cold intensely. Maybe it was you were standing outside your home, you lost your house key, nobody was home, and your next door neighbor was, was not there. You just had a thin coat on. How you would be feeling with that wind blowing and the snow um, irritating your face. Or maybe you were in your home for three days, no hydro. Gee, you wished you'd got a generator working so that you could have heat. The temperature was slowly falling. And it didn't matter how many sweaters you put on, you were still cold, cold to the bone. I, I think it's really important because we're feeling really warm right here now. And maybe it's, it's hard to think of what it's like when you're, when you're really cold. You maybe can think of your own experiences. Because uh, one of the most graphic descriptions I think I heard in the past was when Catherine Parr Trail was writing to her relatives back home. This was 1830 in Peterborough. And uh, she was saying that um, May the or March the 1st was the coldest day and night she'd ever experienced. It was 25 degrees in the house and colder outside. And uh, when she was breathing, she said it was very, very difficult to breathe. Her, her lungs were kind of um, shivering and, and uh, feeling really uncomfortable and her breath was freezing on the on her pillow and her blanket. Uh, just down the road in Bond Head, Ellen Osler and her uh, husband, Featherston Osler, they had just come to the community, it wasn't much of a community, uh, to uh, bring the Anglican religion to the, uh, the area. And there was nowhere for them to live. The people that they had been living with for a while found that their house was so small, there really wasn't room for them. So the only place where they could find shelter was in a cattle barn. And this was winter time. The snow was coming in through the uh, cracks in the, between the logs. The milk was freezing. Um, sometimes the parishioners who were supposed to have brought them some food would have forgotten. Maybe the roads were too bad. What the roads were like then wasn't that great. So they spent their time in bed just to keep warm. Uh, Ruth McKendry, who was a very well-known collector, dealer, writer who lived north of Kingston, uh, she uh, lived in an old stone house and uh, she had pickers who would come to visit her periodically and they would be bringing um, they would be bringing things for her to buy in the back of their truck. And one day, um, she noticed that there was some kind of a blanket that was wrapped around one of the pieces of furniture. She unwrapped the blanket and thought, oh, this is awfully dirty. So she washed it and lugged it out to the line, hung it over the line, and there was a little seam rip. And through the seam, she could see that something was sticking out. So she took her scissors and cut the seam open and out she, she took a, a coat, a, a wool skirt, a pair of stockings, and a petticoat. And she thought some poor soul must have been so desperate to have something warm to wear that they had to make themselves a sort of comforter uh, using their old clothes to keep warm. Um, the settlers had a, an idea that Canadian winters were cold. Um, Alan Osler, for example, she brought a fur cape with her and she packed, uh, she had dresses made that were lined with a woolen fabric. But when they got here, their trunks were stored in a barn somewhere and they couldn't get at the barn where their trunks were. Uh, so she probably didn't have access to that nice fur coat that she had. Um, Susanna Moody, uh, she told people to be sure to bring good quality blankets from home because the blankets here were very expensive and they weren't of very good quality. So that was kind of a starting out feeling about our Canadian winters and, and how that probably held people back somewhat. Um, however, if you were a loyalist in the 18, 1820s, 
you were you were given a few supplies to help you out. You were given some yardage, some uh, cotton fabric, some uh, woolen fabric, uh, clothing, uh, leather shoes, uh, an axe, an iron pot, and maybe an ox. And that was what you had to work with, plus what you were able to bring from home, which if you were wealthy enough and you, you could bring enough luggage with you, maybe it was a little bit better. But otherwise, you'd have to uh, make do with what you had. But the most important thing you could bring with you was your skill to help yourself to survive in this new land and to, uh, to help the community to grow. Now, the weavers uh, were generally men who learned their trade in the British Isles or in Europe. And uh, they were very, very welcome. And uh, the only thing was, with any of the tradesmen, unless they were good at building, it would take them a while before they fulfilled their settlement duties. Because when they came here, they would be given a ticket of location. And they'd have to find where that property was. And there were certain things they had to do in, in order to keep that property, in order to get a deed. They'd have to cut down the trees, they'd have to build a house a certain size, and probably that would be log because we had lots of trees. They had to clear half a road allowance. Of course, they'd want a barn, they'd want, they'd want to acquire animals, they'd want to plant. So this took quite a while before weavers, for example, would have uh, the time and the space to carry out their trade. Um, fortunately, they were handy enough, and there was enough wood. They generally would build their own looms. And at Black Creek, if you ever visit Black Creek, there's a, in the weaver shop, there is a barn loom. And it's a very primitive looking affair. It has two harnesses, so you can weave things that are rather, rather plain. Now, um, in Vaughan Township, there was an, an Irish uh, family, uh, John Kelly. He had been a weaver in Belfast in Ireland. He, wove, he learned how to weave there. And when he came here, he was able to set up a loom in their little house, 1842. And his wife and children would prepare the, prepare the wool for him to weave. And while he was weaving, he'd be educating the children. He'd be reading them stories. And his wife said, well, you know, we've got piles of wool here and piles of wool there, uh, but John is always busy. In fact, he's got more work than he ever, you know, than he can ever fulfill. So I think that uh, it, was a, it was a good thing to be a weaver um, once you got settled. In 1871, uh, there were, in the census, it stated that there were 3,000 weavers in Ontario, so we weren't lacking for, for weavers. And a very interesting part of the census is called the nominal return of the living, which is rather mm. kind of an unusual sort of, sort of thing to see in a census. But it was very useful for doing research because you knew the person's name, where they lived, what their religion was, of course, whether they were male or female, um, what sort of materials they used in their craft, and then what they produced. Uh, so if it was a weaver, the weaver would maybe take in a, a thousand pounds of wool and then be able to produce a certain amount of yard goods. Now there were three woolen mills here in this area, in South Simcoe, and they were in Tecumseh. And one was, uh, one was um, owned by John Merrick Sr. and Peter and Patty Ellis probably know that history quite well because John Merrick Sr. would have been Bernice Ellis's great grandfather. Would that be right, Peter? I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I told you something you didn't know. <laughs> well, John, John Merrick, uh, or Merrick, built the church here in Newton Robinson. So in, in my presentation tonight, I'm trying as best I can to bring in as much of the local history as I can. So I, I thought this was, this was very exciting, the fact that there were three woolen mills in Tecumseh. 
Um, the the Merrick um, woolen mill did very well. They employed 13 people in uh, 1871. Uh, they uh, processed 20,000 20, pounds of wool annually. And this was good because for all of Simcoe County, the number was 90,000. So for this relatively small community to have uh, produce that much uh, weaving was pretty good. Uh, in 1862, uh, John Wallace, uh, Bert Platt writes about in his book about the history of Beaton. He had a water-powered woolen mill, and Beaton, of course, used to be Clarksville. In 1900, uh, this woolen mill became a knitting mill. And people remember, at the time, this was some years ago, but people remember walking by there and seeing these Arctic socks on stretchers, the wooden stretchers. And uh, they might be behind you. Okay. I'm just absolutely thrilled to have these because these wear, there's nothing like being able to handle the pack. These were the wooden sock stretchers. Kind of interesting shape. Mm -hmm. Now the only thing about the, the woolen socks was the toes needed to be sewed up. So this was a cottage <coughs> industry. The uh, women, with their needle skills, they'd take a bunch of socks home and they'd sew up the toes. Other people remember the, the water, the waterway running through um, running through uh, Beaton, and it was colored, colored with the dye that was used for the socks. And I think, well, when I think of the Arctic socks, I think they were gray with white cuffs and heel, and then a, like a little red band. Maybe it was the red dye from the from the band that people saw in the stream. And the third weaver was. Way south, uh, the first concession, just before you get to Highway 9, Samuel Dennis, he was a Welsh Quaker, uh, and there was a receipt from John Kurzweil, and of course Kurzweil's was a, were a very well-known name in this area, they were one of the early settlers, and John Kurzweil had um, seven pounds of wool carded, which is rather small, but this is what was so wonderful about these woolen mills is that they, they made life so much easier because the people who had to had their own farm and their own sheep, they, they needed the, the, wool, uh, the wool to be carded to get all the junk out of it. And, they, and it was nice if it could be all carded and then they'd come back, they'd pick it up and then they could spin it and then and knit with it and, and use it. Uh, in 1871, uh, Samuel Dennis had a sawmill and a woolen mill in the same, on the same stream, and he employed 11 people. So you can see that South uh, Simcoe, Tecumseh, was, was a busy place that way. Now during the, uh, now this is Bradford, I haven't said anything about Bradford, West Wollenbury, but there's a real biggie here, and, and I, will, uh, I will tell you about this, because it was very exciting to find. Now, in 1862, with the American Civil War, the cotton that was used in weaving was uh, used to be very cheap and in plentiful, easy to get it back and forth across the border. But uh, during the Civil War, there was a shortage. The cotton wasn't coming across. So the, the um, uh, Canadian government did a bit of research to see if flax could be grown here. The soil seemed good. The weather seemed good. Um, they were giving out packets of imported flax seed at the agricultural fairs. So Bradford was all set to go, and they put out $300, which was probably a pretty fair amount in, in um, yeah. the 1860s, mm -hmm. to uh, build a scutching mill. Now, a scutching mill would, if you know how flax grows, the, 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 um, the flax itself that you would use for your, your spinning and weaving, uh, you need to separate it from all the um, vegetative material that surrounds it. So a, a scutching mill would break down the flax so that you would get the fibers. Well, unfortunately, uh, it didn't work out. 
when I looked at the, uh, the records in uh, 1871, there was a big X through the Bradford Scutching Mill, which was, which, was, which was too bad. But I don't think that linen was really all that popular. I think linen tends to be cold, and unless it's in really, really good quality, it's, very, it's kind of unpleasant to wear. So maybe that was maybe part of the reason. Or maybe it was just too much work. Sure, you managed to get the fibers out, but then uh, you had a lot more work to do to turn them into something that you could use to weave with. Uh, there were four weavers in West Gwillimbury. They were from Ireland. In Tecumseh, there was two weavers and four carters. They were from England and uh, Ireland. And one of the weavers was 86 years old. Imagine having to weave when you're 86 years old. I don't know. Uh, James Malone had his own shop. Um, he was one of the few that had his own, like a smaller shop. He employed two people, but in the course of the year, he uh, processed a thousand pounds of wool and fifty pounds of cotton to make flannel. Now, flannel isn't like what we think of today as like flannel. Flannel is a, a wool kind of a wool fabric. So I forgot to do this. And I don't want to make a big deal of it right now, but I was going to give everybody, or pass this around for everybody to take, just take a piece of fabric. And just, and just take it and hold it, but you can't keep it. <laughs> <laughs> so the basket that I'm uh, passing around has little bits of homespun. And uh, homespun plays a very important part in, in my talk. So I guess I'm ready to show you some slides. And then you can see what, whether you like them or not. Now, if you, if you are a single person, or you, you were a widow, uh, you had to either earn a living or you had to live with somebody to earn your keep. So the, term, the, ar the archaic term spinster was an unmarried lady who spun. And you'll see that word in the census quite a lot, so you know there's an unmarried lady who, is, who can spin. And that was quite a quite a wonderful skill to have. Uh, a poster at Upper Canada Village. Uh, if anybody has been to Upper Canada Village, they have the most complete um, woolen mill. Not only do they spin and card card and spin wool, but they do they do everything from the sheep's fleece to the finished product, which is a blanket. Now, they used to do this. I'm not sure whether they still do it or not, but it's fascinating to watch. And I've taken slides, and I also have a little book on the table that has photographs of, of what this looks like. Um, the, the building, as you know, when the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway was coming through, the land was going to be flooded with water. So there was a, a, quite an acreage of land. It was a farm, and it had been set aside to save some of the old buildings that would have been underwater. And one of these buildings was a mill, and it came from Odessa. And this was the mill that they use at Upper Canada Village to show people how a water-powered uh, woolen mill would work. First, uh, the, farm, the farmers would bring in their sheep, uh, they would uh, shear the sheep and bring the fleece to the mill. The mill would give it a wash first and then lay it out on the grass to dry. And uh, you, can, you can see inside the mill here uh, is, um, there's a set of drums here. They're, they're carding drums. The first drum uh, picks out a lot of the, the detris, detris from, the, from the wool. It's really, really messy. It's a messy thing. 
because sheep get in all sorts of things. Unless you can train your sheep not to lay down in the grass and get green spots on their bodies or not to do the things that sheep are prone to do, uh, a lot of that stuff comes out in the with the first drum. Now the second drum that you see uh, refines the wool. It, it, it's straightening the fibers so that they all run the same way. And you get this lovely silky um, a fiber, it's called roving, roving, and that roving, you can see it looping around, and it gets put onto drums at the very back there, and from there, the wool is, goes on to spindles that look like this. And believe it or not, one man can operate this great long machine and as he pulls it back a couple of yards and then moves it forward it fills those little uh, bobbins there with wool. Oops. It fills, oh thanks, fills the little bobbins with, with wool. This was a very noisy job it was, it's a water-powered uh, loom. Uh, one gentleman is uh, making sure that if something breaks, he'll repair it. But it pretty well, uh, he, um, the, the shuttle goes back and forth mechanically. Normally, when you're weaving, if you were sitting at a loom yourself, you have to throw that shuttle, catch it, and then throw it back the other way. But with this, um, with this machinery, the, it, it does that automatically. But, uh, and because it's this century, he's wearing ear, ear protectors. This was a very noisy job and it was very dusty. Uh, after the blanket has been made, it gets fulled. And when you fold something, you want to condense it, make it warmer. <coughs> Or something like that, that pot on the stove could also be used for the dyes. This is a, a fascinating piece of machinery. It's called a, a teasel, teasel jig, and what you're seeing there are teasels. There's 240 of them. They would be imported from England because the teasels that we have here that just grow wild aren't very strong. But the ones that are imported from England are, you can use them 75 times and then you turn them over on the other side and what they do is they pull up the nap on the blanket this would be optional if the customer wanted it or not Oops. <coughs> okay um, what you're looking at here is, uh, is a piece, is a blanket with some of these initials embroidered in it. It's an old blanket, it's very good condition, and the reason I have it on the screen is so you can see the weave. It's called a tabby weave. It's like a basket weave over and under and under and over. And it's the sort of blanket that uh, if, you were a we if you were a weaver uh, and you had a simple loom, you could make this yourself at home. This is a very humble blanket. It's very thin. It's been mended many times. And I, I found it at uh, Simcoe County Museum with the help of Daryl Wines, who's uh, one of the very valued employ employees there. And uh, it's an interesting blanket because it was woven at Nicholson Mill. And we don't really have a lot of that sort of material evidence of, of our past here. Um, it's an interesting blanket too because it's only 30 in each strip. It's, it was uh, woven in two strips. Each strip, is the loom is only 30 inches wide. So you can't have a blanket 30 inches wide on your bed. So you needed two strips of material and sewed them down the middle and you had, uh, you had an adequate blanket. So if you're looking at a blanket and you see a seam down the middle, you can say, aha, that blanket has quite a bit of age to it, probably maybe 1850 or earlier. 
This is one of my favorite blankets. It's, uh, it, was a, it was a surprise gift. Um, and it is a tabby weave, under and over, under and over. And the, uh, it looks like it was dyed with madder, which is a natural dye, but you'd have to purchase it. And indigo, which is uh, a natural dye as well, that you'd have to purchase. This would definitely not be the work of a professional weaver because you can see the seam doesn't match, does it? Mm -hmm. um, this would be a very expensive kind of, of uh, coverlet to have because it, it's, it would require a loom that has many harnesses. So you, you'd have to be a professional weaver in order to weave such a complicated weave. And I can always remember what an overshot coverlet looks like because some of the uh, pattern, the threads sit up on top. And if you had a cat with claws, the claws would get caught in those, those stitches that are just kind of loose there. I have a sample here on the table that you can see afterwards, so you'll know, you'll know what I mean. A very handsome uh, blanket. Um, Waterloo County. A lot of the textiles that we have collected are from the county. Uh, I brought uh, I brought one of these dub double cloth coverlets here for you to see for real. This was a, an earlier double cloth coverlet, and it's very descriptive because it actually is a double cloth. There's, there's, there's two, two blankets being woven at the same time, and they're connected by the, the, uh, by the, the, the uh, warp, the weft threads as they're coming, coming through. Because as you know, the, the, the warp goes north and south on the loom. Those are the threads that you have to put on the loom yourself. It takes quite a while. And then the weft or woof is what goes around the shuttle that passes back and forth. So in, in this particular textile, it's, it's a simple design, but it's two, it's two coverlets that have been woven together. So, of course, it's twice as expensive. And what's really special about it is that there was a corner that was cut out of it, and then it was bound with cotton fabric. And the reason the corner was cut out was there was a bedpost there, and the, the bed was in a, one of those ceilings that slopes. Mm -hmm. And so, so you're seeing the, the cutout there. Um, the jacquard coverlet is the most, the best, the best of weaving, um, very, very cherished. Probably people, although they could hardly afford it, would have one made for their, their wedding through their marriage. Well, now, whether they used it a lot is another thing, because lots of times when we do see these, they're in just absolutely pristine condition. And I, I brought our jacquard coverlet here. And it was woven by a Wilhelm Armbrust, who was uh, of German descent. He had come from Pennsylvania, where he'd learned how to use the jacquard loom. Now, the jacquard loom, And when you see the pictures in my little book, you'll understand it maybe better. It's, it's quite complicated, but it's an attachment. And the, car, the cards are punched cards like this. So, and this is only one card. There'd be many, many, many of them. And they would be organized in a certain sequence in order to do very elaborate weaving. Um, because before this time, you, you could not do things that look real like real, realistic flowers or birds or houses or any of those things. A double cloth, a double cloth coverlet. Um, I don't know the history of it, but I've got it there for a reason. It is a coverlet and it's woven. I want you to look at it, and then I want you to look at the next slide and see what you think. Any similarity? 
Anybody notice? With the design? Can you go back Put and back. show us again? Well, you, you maybe can't tell that from where you are, but the, the second slide is a quilt. So quite often there was a, there was sort of a transfer of artistic skills and observations because they're, they're quite similar, but very different to make. Now, this is probably the most exciting uh, textile I think I have in, in my slides. And I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but what do you see that is kind of unusual? Is it like a crest in the middle? Mm -hmm. Or a butterfly? Or yes. Something? It looks a bit like a butterfly. But it's a bee. Oh. And bee? you know where bees are. Bees were, yes, from Beaton. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that could be a slide in your presentation, Bert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So unfortunately, um, the, the person that owned this uh, coverlet, um, she let me see it years and years ago, and I took a picture of it, and I dearly wish I had taken more pictures so you could see what the whole, um, what the, the whole textile looked like. But unfortunately, I, I don't know why I didn't, but I, I didn't, it was a long time ago. Um, it was... Um, what happened to it? Well, the person that owns it still has it, and I don't know where she lives now, and she's probably no longer with us. She was an active, her last name was Reed. It was Florence, Florence Reed, and she lived in Lafroy. I don't know if anybody, uh, and her husband's name, her husband's name was Buzz. Anyway, the um, she was the great-granddaughter of a, a Sutherland that lived in West Cornbury. And he had sheep, and he <coughs> took the fleece to the mill in, in Beaton, and had the had the, uh, the the fleece made into wool, and had this coverlet woven. So I'm wondering if it was only done one time, because that would be a lot of work for just one coverlet, and it would be a double cloth coverlet. Um, she thought um, her name wasn't Florence, it was something like that. She, she thought that it was after 1860 that this was woven. And I think because of the colors and the number of colors, I think it would be sort of later in the 1800s when, it, when it was woven. Line on it? I don't know. I had Barclay House at the time, and I was interested in all those sorts of things. And somehow or other, I don't, I don't even remember how we met. But that was a very, very special bit of history there. And it, it makes sense because um, D.A. Jones, as you know, made um, Beaton Beaton, because it was Clarksburg before that. And there were like flower bags and wraps around pounds of butter with his name on it and, and a bee, you know, some kind of a bee. So I don't know, Bert, if there's anything around that has bees on it that would look anything like the bee on this coverlet. It'd be really, really neat. Really neat to know about. Star uh, coverlets and um, quilts were very popular. These are these are both woven. Now, does anybody recognize that fine young gentleman? <laughs> That's Bruce Chambers. In front of your house? No, no. This was the the Ferris. Uh, this was very very exciting too, and it's local history. But uh, back in 2015, um, the Ferrises were uh, selling their um, selling the contents of their home, and it it was interesting because three generations of Ferrises had lived there. So this particular piece of furniture would be uh, from the first set of people that live there. And I included it because it is a blanket box and oh, yeah. all these textiles were stored in some kind of a box. But it's an interesting 
uh, situation because it's a transitional chest. It was in between the blanket box and the chest of drawers. So you get blanket box on the top and chest of drawers on the bottom. Hmm. Uh, Scottish ingrain carpeting, it's uh, in our parlor. Uh, it's, uh, it was woven in Scotland, woven in strips, and the strips were hand sewn together. Um, it was installed by someone that loved doing the work. Um, the the uh, Red Lion Weavers in Pennsylvania wove this rug and a young man came and laid it down for us. And really, you'd think it cost an arm and a leg and it should have, but he was very reasonable. And we, we love the carpet. The only thing is it is tends, tending to fade, which isn't so great. But when you come and see us, uh, at the annual picnic and you like, you can come in the parlor and you can see it for real. Mm. Lots of leftover fabrics, fabrics that were worn out, no good for anything else. Perfect place for them was for a, a woven rag rug. And these were a lot more common than the in parlors, uh, in hallways, up and down stairs. Much more common than the uh, Scottish ingrain carpet would have been. A hooked mat, uh, lots of opportunity for bits of fabric that uh, would otherwise not be put to use. And the basket of fabrics that I passed around, if you could see this slide a little better, you could see that a lot of those tiny little squares are squares of homespun. And uh, this, this homespun was used for shirts, petticoats, dresses, blankets, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a simple tabby weave, and it was, uh, well, 18, 1850, so it kind of goes a long way back. If you were at a quilting bee, or you, a neighbor had a quilt you liked a lot, as soon as you got home, you'd you put together a little sample of it so you'd have it as a reference for when you were planning uh, a quilt of your own. Upper Canada Village, uh, the year we were there, which was quite a long time ago, they were reproducing quilts that were in their collection. The ladies would shop very carefully for <coughs> fabrics that were similar. And uh, you see three very excellent quilts. They went to a lot of trouble to make these quilts because they even filled them with wool. And that's, the wool has to be very clean, very, very clean, because as you know, if there's any grease in the wool, it would seep through the fabric that was being used to make the quilts. And quilts have interesting names. Uh, the red and white one is uh, Drunkard's Pathway. Uh, the other one in the middle is uh, Goose or turkey, turkey Tracks. And the one that's closest to you is Double Irish Chain, and that would be a it's a very simple quilt that probably a young woman anticipating marriage would make for her hope chest. The clothes line, every year I take all my textiles and I, and I hang them up on the line sometime between May and November. Last year it was in November because I didn't quite get around to getting them all out. And it's very satisfying because I can kind of keep track of how things are. If there's any little things flying around, I think, oh, oh, but so far I've been very lucky because they haven't had any moth damage. Any damage that was done was done when I purchased these, we purchased these um, items. And in the background there is the orange hall. It doesn't look like that anymore, but that was uh, not too long after the building was, uh, had been taken down and then was being put back up again. Uh, I don't have any applique quilts in, in my collection, but this quilt comes from the Simcoe County Museum. I took a picture of it when I was there a couple of weeks ago. And it was um, made by a lady who lives in Thornton, in eight, or lived in Thornton in, in 1870. And if anybody does any kind of handling of fabric to try to take a circle and make circles, yeah. it's very, very difficult. When do you think she would have made that? It looks kind of modern. Like, it, it does. That's what I thought, too. It has a very modern look to it. 
But no, I think it was 1870. That she made it? That she made it. Oh, for goodness sakes. And the colors, they were actually a dark, dark green. It looks like black, but it's dark green, but the orange color is quite accurate. Uh, a quilt like this is wool. Um, it's all wool. It has many names. Hole, hole in the Barn Door, Dash Churn, uh, Monkey Wrench. Many star quilts, and this was star, Stars in the Milky Way. Rolling star, uh, variable star. Uh, this is different than, than, than any of the quilts that we have found in Waterloo County because the design goes right to the edge. You'll notice mm -hmm. with the quilts that I've shown you so far that there's a, a nice border, which is nice because it makes like a frame for what you put in the middle. But this quilt doesn't have that. It's right to the edge, and then it has binding around it so that it doesn't get all raggedy. And this was made by a church group in Woodbridge, and I, I don't know when, but I've, we've used it on our beds quite a few times and washed it. It washes beautifully. It's a very nice quilt. Uh, this uh, quilt is probably one of the hardest star quilts to make, the Star of Bethlehem, and there's many variations. Uh, to this design, but you'd have to have everything just line up just so. Or if you have one thing that's out of line, then by the time you get to the end of, an, of a design element, you're just, well, you probably want to sit down and cry. <laughs> <laughs> so th this quilt is different too because it, it's very soft, and I think it was made of flannelette, colored flannelette. So that's not that easy to work with either because it's kind of you like to work with crisp fabrics, they're easier to work with. Uh, called Feather, Fe Feather um, Star of Bethlehem, because it has that kind of, a, kind of a feathery look to it. It has a strange color to it because I took the picture in the winter time, and you know what happens to snow and white, you get a blue, kind of a blue tinge. A very nice uh, design, it's on black, uh, it's a <coughs> fan, and there's a lot of fancy stitching around each of the elements. Simcoe County Museum, a log cabin quilt, the design goes right to the edge. Very well made and really challenging because it's, there's cotton in there, there's wool, and there's velvet. And to try to work with all those different materials with little narrow strips. And as you probably know, log cabins they all look like that. They all basically look like logs. And usually in the middle, there's a red square because that's the hearth, the fire in the hearth, so you have a red square. Um, this was, um, I think this was around, this was around 1872. And uh, let's see now, Oro Township. This is a real stunning quilt. You did wonderful here, uh, Janine. Jean had to fiddle with the colors, and, and she's, she's got them spot on. And you'll, you'll see that's the quilt that's on the chair here. And it's a, uh, to be really skillful at doing a log cabin type quilt, you need to have dark areas and light areas, and you need to be consistent in order for it to, to register as a design. So this one, you, you can see quite clearly, it's a diamond within a diamond within a diamond. But sometimes it was a pineapple design, or it was a courthouse steps. There was many different ways of arranging those logs to form different patterns. Who could resist? It was a sale, it was a, a sunny afternoon in Waterloo County, and there was this chair, a painted yellow ochre, with a log cabin back pad and a seat pad, and of course we had to buy it. Plus it was a good, really good buy. An American quilt, very different than our quilts, because this quilt is on a double bed and it goes right to the floor. The quilts that were made here were more for a three-quarter bed, which is not a double bed and it's not a single bed, but it just sort of just comes over the edge and that's about it.
but this one went right to the floor. And I'm not sure what it's called, but it's a, it's a really, really well-made quilt, and uh, I'm very proud to have it. You can't really appreciate these from a, a distance, but it's a crazy quilt. And this is coming at a time that was so different than when we, we looked at the first slides, when people were just settling here. There's no way on earth that something like this would ever have been produced in the, in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe 70s, 80s. It's getting on towards the heavy-duty Victorian era. Women were, had sewing machines and they had access to all kinds of fancy velvet taffeta silk scraps. And they had the time. They weren't churning butter or spinning wool. They had time to indulge their uh, stitchery skills. And I'll show you the next slide and you'll see what I mean. I hope. Yeah. There you go. You can see it up close, a uh, detail of some of the needlework. And lots of times they would incorporate little symbols. Like this was a, probably a, a loyalist because there's a, a, a crown and the Union Jack. They're hard to see from where you're sitting, but they're there. And sometimes people would incorporate uh, prize ribbons that they'd want at fairs. They'd incorporate that into the crazy quilts. Very, very, very special. This quilt uh, was the first time I'd ever seen a man quilting. It was back in the 70s. And, and I just stood there, and I, I, I didn't even know, hardly know what to say. So I finally said, oh, gee, you're, you're an anomaly. And he said, no, not really. Uh, but I just had never seen a man quilt before. Well, um, this, this gentleman, um, John, sorry, metal block here, uh, he, I, I googled him today, and he has, he has had quite a career in uh, Willard. John Willard, that was his name. And he's had quite a career in quilting. He's made many, many, many quilts, taught at Halliburton. And this was his, sort of his first quilt, one of his first quilts, and he did a series of four. He was just absolutely fascinated with the history around the Titanic. And uh, so quilt number four, he had printed on the quilt the 2,000 people that lost their lives. He'd incorporated their names in the waves. So I felt rather sad to, to hear that he, he passed away. He wasn't that old, not any older than me. <laughs> so I, you know, his, his, he was born the same year I was, so I thought, oh my, you know, he's not that old. That's him. That's right, yeah. So uh, he, um, he said the only, the only real rule about quilting is there should be no rules. You should do it for pleasure. And uh, that's what he did. And he, his quilts were just, well, just Google uh, John Wilford Quilter, Willard, and you'll, you'll see some of his work, and it's awesome. The era of the red and white quilt seems to be around 1900 to 19. 25, sort of in there. This was an <coughs> embroidered quilt, um, strictly decorative. It uh, was made by Addie Rogers. Oh. Her mother made that quilt, and she had it in her, uh, where she lived in uh, Tottenham. One of our members uh, donated a signature quilt to the Simcoe County Museum. Uh, it's a very lo lovely quilt, and we took it around to try to to try to find out um, under what circumstances it was made. There's a lot of names here that people recognized, yeah. but they were they were names that like Loblaw and Banting as well. So signature quilts were quite popular at a certain time. You would you would pay a quarter, a dime or a quarter to have your name embroidered. Actually, there's a, a signature a signature quilt, a commemorative quilt at the back of the room here. Uh, one of my favorite quilts, very simple. Uh, one of the names for this particular design is uh, chimney sweep. 
and uh, it's red and white. It was probably um, made around 1920, and it comes from a local home. And one of our members lived in that home for a while. Several of our members, Jan Dunn, I don't know, Franz Schwanen, if he's here, would remember Jan Dunn. And then Paul Michaelis lived in that house. Well, that's where that quilt came from. Passing on skills. Uh, from a Butterick knitting book, uh, grandmother's teaching her little granddaughter to <coughs> <laughs> so here uh, we have a number of irons. Wash day was not fun. I'm sure most of you know about sorting out the laundry. Monday you wash, Tuesday you iron, and then you bake the next day. Every day of the week there's a certain day you do something. But the one thing that's interesting is if you like to iron properly nowadays, you've got an iron that's got a Teflon base on it, so you've got to be really careful with it because it scratches. And it's so light, you can never put a proper crease if you want to put a crease in a pair of flannel trousers. But there was an arm for every purpose here, and one of the arms, the second from the top, is a crimping arm. So the part that goes on top is uh, has grooves in it, and you would heat that on your stove. And then you take it, you, you take your piece of fabric that needed to have the creases in it, and you and you would uh, rock it back and forth to make those little pleats again. Because when you wash it, the pleats would all come out. Uh, the next iron underneath was fired with charcoal. You put charcoal right inside there, and there were vents for some of the heat to come out. So you had to be kind of a bit strong, you know, a bit muscle there to wheel those arms back and forth. Most of us think the umbrella clothesline, the collapsible clotheslines, are relatively new invention. They weren't. This was 1860 something, when, uh, and it's all wood, and it, uh, you know, it's collapsible, and it, you hang your clothes up on it. It doesn't take much room. It's a very, very practical thing to have. Now, you, you will be sad to know that this is the, the end, but not quite. Would somebody like to read that, please? I slept and dreamed that life was beauty. And somebody else can read the next one? So I thought that was a fitting way to end this adventure of fabrics.